those units to do all that um, red on stack testing. The downfall of that, that is uh, we ended up incurring $43,000 in fuel costs. Uh, we were able to sell some of that into the market for around $10,000 of market sales, but we ended up losing or had a net loss on generating during that time of about $33,000. Why it's important is those things don't come up every year. You know, the permitting comes up every five, six, seven years. Obviously, the gas prices have been significantly higher than what has been in the past. So you're going to see a couple of those things as we have to do is we have to run our units either for major overhauls or, you know, for this, what was for our permitting, that we just may end up having an additional expense or a loss there that we just can't recover in the market. So we had that for the month of March and April. So that added to a little bit of the problem as well um, on a negative loss. You're going to see that same general thing in May. Um, you know, we did the pigging um, that we had to do on the high consequent area out there. We're going to see the same thing. We had about $42,000 in fuel costs. We ended up making some about 15000 in market sales, but we had about a $27,000 net loss on the fuel that it took to run units one and nine to do the pigging operation out there. So those are some things that we know we're going to get stuck um, having that come up periodically and some of those things. So we'll watch some of those types of things when they come up, but you know, if, when you're buying at the spot market off the gas, you know, gas off the market or the swing gas, and you're having to schedule <clears throat> some of these different types of events periodically, you might get stuck with some of that. So, so just those are some things that added on the electric side. On the gas side, otherwise that, that's trending pretty well for the most part other than some of the fuel and some of the operating expense areas that we've touched on in the past. On the gas side, it was a colder April, so we were up 31% in gas usage um, on that side. So the revenues were up just under 390,000, but the purchase gas was up just under 400,000. Um, I think just one thing to keep in mind as we move into the cost of service workshop last or next Tuesday is we are eroding some of our gross margin on that side, and it's been a, a trend here for a while now. A couple things happening there. One, when we restructured our rates through the last cost of service, there was a cognizant effort to, you know, make sure that the natural gas rates were a little bit more competitive, and we brought down some of that margin because we didn't necessarily need to have all that margin on the natural gas side. So you're starting to see some of that over the last couple of years as we've restructured our rate components. Um, and then the other piece is the swing gas has just been significantly higher uh, than what we've been used to over the last several years. So a combination of those types of things are eroding some of our margin. Um, even though we had you know 31% increase in sales, our margins were down for just under 15% for the month. So year to date, we're still running about 37% gross margin. If you look at 19 and 20, where we were typically running about 46 to 47% margin there. So we were, you know, we pulled down about you know 10 to 11% in gross margin. So that's just something not to alarm you guys because we're still we still have plenty of margin there. We still have a good rate of return on this side, but that is something that um, is trending a little bit down, and I anticipate some of that staying fairly consistent with just the natural gas prices um, on that side. As it relates to, you know, the rate state, the fuel rate, fuel cost rate stabilization fund, that benchmark on the natural gas side is $5.25. So whenever we go above that as far as our gas costs, we'll charge the customers. If it's well below that, we'll issue credits back. So three out of the four months this um, year have been about $5.25 where Prior to some of this happening over the last year, most of the time we were in that four dollar, four fifty range. So that's just another indication that some of that additional gas that we're having to buy that isn't locked up in contracts is, is more expensive. So, so we'll have to talk a little bit about that, and you'll see some of that in the in the forecast, and we'll talk about that in the workshop. But overall, uh, things are going really good on on that side as well. Just a couple things to note and keep in mind as we have the workshop to think about those as we go into the next cost of service study. So. Any questions on any of the financials? Huh? Okay, make a motion to approve the financial statements. I'll make a motion to approve the financial statements. Motion by Bob. I'll second. Second by Anthony. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Agenda item number four is open forum. I don't see any new guests today. Uh, agenda item number five, communication, city administrator. 
for you. Don't have a whole lot, mm -hmm. unless you got young kids, or if you guys are interested, the Quadex Center opens a week from today. So that's about it. So. Police department going well? Yeah. Um, moving well now that we have soils issues taken care of, so we still have a, a hope that it will be completed by the end of the year. So let me drive by. I think they poured the floor yesterday for the garage, and the block is going pretty quick there. Okay. All right, divisions. Ken, got anything? Yeah, um, our transmission system coordination study, the results for that came back a couple, a couple of weeks ago. We had DGR do that for us. Um, that was a work order I brought to the board last year for approval. Um, everything looked good. What they did in that study is they go through and evaluate all of our relays to make sure all the settings are correct and that if the protection's there in case something does happen on the system that it'll trip when it's supposed to trip and not uh, escalate from there. So uh, that's on the transmission side. Um, so he said he went through, ran a bunch of scenarios, and everything looked good. He said a few little tweaks that we can do, and so we'll be doing that here this summer probably. But nothing he said. There was no large issues. Um, and those settings have been there for most part of about 20 years now. So make a few changes to bring it up to 2022 standards. Um, but other than that, he said everything's looked really good. Um, so other than that, uh, but that was it. And that's something that we'll have to do every six years because it's a NERC requirement. They want you to evaluate your settings. And, um, it won't be as extensive next time because we did this one now. It's kind of a base. And now they'll evaluate if there's a lot of large changes in the area. We may have to do a full-blown uh, study again, but uh, probably won't. It'll probably just be a quick review and then you sign off on it, and then you're good for another six years. But everything was good. Yeah. Uh, construction's full swing. Um, a lot of commercial development this year. We've, it happened in May. We're kind of working on that now. And then you'll see us starting next week, starting some reconductor projects, kind of off 2nd Avenue, down by Lincoln Avenue down there, and then starting up by Dock right on the north, on North 15. we got to do some work up there. They did a little addition on that building, so that's what we're doing. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, as far as the natural gas division, <coughs> excuse me, last week, as Jeremy alluded to, T.D. Williamson was here Monday through Wednesday morning. Uh, we ran all the cleaning picks through our pipe. We ran the two smart pigs through our pipe, and I will make my coal on the generation gas. I can pay for, like, so that it doesn't affect their budgets. But um, the two ILI runs, or the, in, the in, inline inspection runs, the first tool we ran was the deformation tool, looking for dents, gouges, scratches. Uh, came out, I haven't seen the final data yet, but the, the, the run, 100% data collected. The second run, uh, which was the, what they, they call it, the XYZ tool, and then the gas magnetic flux leakage tool, uh, we had an issue with, uh, lost, after a thousand feet of running, we lost 20% of the sensors. So we didn't collect 20% of the circumference of the pipe data. So we are working with TD Williamson to reschedule the gas magnetic flux leakage run. I uh, had a phone call, the engineering firm and myself had a phone call with them Monday. We have another phone call with them Friday to work out details. And um, uh, hopefully we can get them back in sometime this year. Uh, the, plant, the, the crops are planted out there now, so we may have to wait until after the crops come off. Um, just <laughs> as a side note, just finished our inspection with pipeline safety. Just. 45 minutes ago, there I made them aware of our runs, um, and they understand that one failed. So if we have to run it and the outside of the timeline, they're fine with it. <coughs> they understand. So uh, we'll, we'll keep on working. So that's their error on their machine. Uh, yeah, something. Uh, of course, nobody's admitting anything yet, but uh, they're they're guessing. Um, We'll know Friday for sure, but they're guessing, and I don't believe them, that it hit a weld or something and knocked out a bunch of the sensors. I don't believe that because the other tools ran fine. That doesn't make sense to me. But uh, yeah, as far as our engineering firm and I am concerned, it's their problem, not ours. So okay. we'll do it again. <laughs>
And I, I have to thank the gas crew. Uh, we're, we're really short of people right now, and, and they were all out there all three days working very hard uh, with, and with the TDW guys, and they were just fantastic. They were a great crew to work with. So it was, it was very interesting. All right, thank you. Human Resources. Angie, do you have anything? Uh, we're continuing to work on filling the welder service person uh, position. Okay. Legal. Not Mark today. Mm -hmm. General Manager. Just one quick thing. There's uh, quite a lot of things I'm working on, but we'll touch on that stuff at the workshop next week. Uh, we'll go into a little bit more in depth on some of the things. Mm -hmm. I'm still finishing up a few calls here this week on a couple other things that may impact the five-year budget forecast. So, so I won't kind of elaborate on that stuff today. Uh, the one thing I did send you guys is just kind of a general update on what's going on to the legislature. Um, and then, obviously, wanted to give you guys a head up on the MISO load shedding um, scenario that could possibly be something that comes on the pike this year. So I want to make you guys aware of that um, piece. Um, try to elaborate a little bit on some of the things that are going on, and it's... I guess I'll frame it up as it's not just necessarily the MISO market, but there's also other energy markets that are facing some similar uh, potential issues with having increased load this summer, projected for what they say is going to be one of the hotter summers on kind of record. And so um, MISO, unfortunately, is one of the ones that probably has one of the more extreme uh, potential cases of heightened awareness where we'd have to shed load in town. Um, right now they're estimated if they hit some of the peak loads that we're there are going to be about five gigawatts short of having enough generation to meet um, the load that's out there um, and they've even talked about um, there came out even said even under normal summer circumstances that the uh, MISO market could be short some load so we got fairly close last year we issued out you know some communication to our customers and some of our large customers we said hey you know just giving you a heads up we're just starting to get up there in severity where we may be asked to shed load to keep the stability of the grid intact. We Unfortunately, we didn't hit that, but there is a heightened sense of that this year. A um, couple of things that I mentioned in the email, you know, obviously the high load projections are one of the issues going on. Um, there's been a lot more legacy retirements as far as large base load plants going offline. At the same time, a lot of stuff to replace that either hasn't come online yet, it, it's either behind in the permitting um, side of things. Um, so that's becoming an issue is there's more load or more generation coming off than going on. That's an issue. Some of the stuff coming on, particularly in the MISO market, is a lot of renewables, particularly wind. And obviously you guys are well aware that wind and solar are intermittent resources. The wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine, particularly when it's hot. Um, a lot of times when it's super hot and muggy, the wind isn't blowing, so they're going to have potentially less wind generation going on, and the same token with less natural gas and coal to supplement potential loads. That's an issue. Uh, some other things going on kind of cross markets. Uh, the, right now, they're, they're, um, the southwest and the west are already in a severe drought, and we haven't even hit the summer months yet, and if you guys have been watching any of Texas, um, they're probably going to have the hottest May on record down there. What's happening though, a lot of hydro, you know, they didn't get a lot of rain last year. They were already in some drought to the west, southwest. Um, and so they, they, can, they anticipate that continuing this year, which means they're going to have less water to run hydro generation. Um, and when that happens and you have less water and less moisture, it also creates more potential for fires which you guys know what happens when you get fire, you get a lot of haze and smoke and then solar doesn't, isn't as effective either. So they've got drought issues where they're just gonna have less hydro going on, which means some of these other markets um, aren't gonna have enough excess capacity to share either. So you're gonna run into some of those interconnection um, issues with being able to share power. Across the country, they're saying above average heat. So that means the PGM market, the ERCOT market, New England, New York, those guys all could be under um, stress as well to provide generation not only number one for their own customers but they're going to have a lack of adequacy to, to move across the grid system so that's going on some of the other things that they've been talking about is just the slow permitting process to upgrade transmission and bring in on generation one of the things recently came out from a couple of the commissioners at FERC they're, they're basically saying no we knew this was coming a lot of the state agencies have the authority to regulate the fleet in their state and as a lot of these states want to go more green and less carbon, 
you know, it, it proposes these problems, right? You're, you're pulling off dispatchable load that's reliable typically, and you're trying to replace it with, you know, intermittent resources that aren't always reliable. And so they need to figure out a different mechanism um, to handle some of those things. Just adding transmission isn't always, you know, isn't the answer as well. That they've got to restructure some of the markets um, from that standpoint. So those are some things going on. Again, we're not the only one in the situation. MRS is going to be working with their members. Um, a lot of our the utility counterparts, you know, they're going to be talking not only with their boards but with their stakeholders. Um, they're going to be having you know things ready to go for communication output for internal um, communication for not only their customers where they may have to shed load but also just for the public so that if we get in situations where people can voluntarily shed some load you know those are some of the things that we would look at we have our own generation in town so certainly typically what they'll do is they'll ask for everyone to kick on their, all their generating units you know as, as a first phase to avoid having to shed load but if we're short generation capacity, particularly in the northern region of Misa, which is where we are at, even even though we kick on all of our generation and it can supply not only our load but also load to the grid, that still may not be enough to cover the load. So, you know, first phase is hey, we'll start getting alerts from Miso. They'll probably ask us to kick on generation. At the same token, you know, we may be ready to communicate something out. Hey, if we can have some, pe you know, if people in town can shed voluntary load without having to do it you know mandatory you know we'll look to do some of those things and then um, make sure with our largest customers that we have a contingency plan in place or at least they have a contingency plan in place if we have to shed you know two megawatts five megawatts ten megawatts so staff has been going through some of that planning process with some of our larger customers of course some of the customers have to kind of look at their own internal operations and do their own internal assessment so they're working through some of that right now and we'll follow back up with them but Typically, we haven't had those issues here, as far as I can remember. And Anthony and I talked as long as he's been on. We haven't really gotten into those situations where that's becoming more of a frequent, heightened concern. Of course, you talk with people in the industry; they have said that we knew this stuff was coming. The way we're trying to push, you know, some of the policies and things that the grid just isn't ready. We're, we're moving too fast and some of this stuff. So. So that's just something that puts us in a bad situation, obviously, um, where we may not have a whole lot of time for we may need to shed load here, or MRS and some of their members have to shed load, or Excel, you know, they shed it, had to shed load last year when we didn't have to. So I think you're going to see a little bit more of that over the next several years until they can figure out a way to get more generation uh, on the market. Perfect, and a perfect indication of that was the capacity markets up in these zones. The auction pricing was, was it 7000 dollars which was astronomical because there just isn't enough load and generation capacity there so so there's a lot of things playing into those issues that are um, causing that so it's just something I think it's important for you guys to be aware of and certainly if we have to start shedding load you know we're gonna get calls you guys are gonna get calls but if we can make people aware that that's a possibility and that you need to have as best contingency plan in place for us if we have to or we're required to do that, um, you know, the better off we all are. So, I had some, I had some questions for you guys on that. Yep. And, and I think as, as I look back, I don't recall having these conversations or at least getting this close to being a reality over my eight or ten years on the commission. So it's getting kind of real, I think, now, and obviously it's something we got to be very very uh, diligent about paying attention to. Our, if I don't remember, for sure our customers aren't going to remember it, right? And if they get interrupted with some forced outages, it's going to be something that we're going to, like Jer to Jeremy's point, we're going to get some phone calls on it because people are used to their lights just being on when they need them to be on and their air conditioner running. Um, so, it'll, so it'll be noticeable and it'll be something they pay attention to and that we'll hear about. So I think we got to be appropriately forward thinking and notifying people what's going on and that this might happen while not being so forward with it that it sounds alarms that don't need to be sounded so right. whatever that balance would be I guess I don't know but I think we got to start thinking and talking about it from a, from our largest customers standpoint um, how are they reacting to it because uh, certainly downtime is a loss of money for them and 
Uh, my question would be, does that, does that significant of a change put them in a situation where they start thinking about distributed generation and self-generation through no fault of much utilities, really, because we have more than enough generation to serve our zip code, right? But does that put, put crosshairs on self-generation first at one or two of our larger consumers? I guess I'm certainly, if I'm sitting in their shoes, I'm certainly, that crosses my mind if it becomes something that's fairly frequent, particularly in the summer months where, you know, at what point do you go, hey, if, I, if I'm going to lose a million dollars worth of product because, you know, the grid is shutting us down locally, you know, you, you, I think there is a more realistic chance that you start thinking a little bit more about the payback and, and the loss of time and having to get units and things and your production lines back up. And if that takes a day to do that and you have to scrap a bunch of materials and product, I, yeah, I think that becomes certainly more of a conversation at that level if you're sitting in one of the customer's um, shoes. Um, and these guys could probably speak, I know those guys have talked more with those guys. I mean, I think they're in the same boat we are. We certainly don't like it. I, certainly they don't necessarily want to be a part of that either where we're having to shed load fairly quickly um, from that regard. They, they're certainly aware that it's not because we're dictating it. You know, we're not going to do that. It's going to be the market. You know, regionally, um, of course, there's frustration um, with with that. You know, people have talked to well. That's that's the responsibility of the Mizo market is to make sure there's plenty of reserves and adequacy there, so we're not running into issues where there's blackouts or where there's lack of stability there, where you're going to ask customers to shed road. Unfortunately, you've got Mizo trying to tell policy and legislators we can't be doing that. We, we're moving too far down the path. You know, policymakers and regulators are pushing this stuff fast, and there isn't a, the balance isn't there. And so, just was what happened at the Aircot market last year. They realized, and they put they changed rules and regulations down there because they were heading down that same path with relying on one or two forms of generation that you can't be fully dependent on that at this point because because red isn't ready for it as far as the advancements and and the stability isn't always there so i don't know how you solve that problem in the short term it's certainly a long-term um, thing that hopefully gets corrected over time there's enough technology to move us in that direction but it, to me it needs to be a little bit more methodical and not so rushed and forced until the ability to to bring on technology to replace you know what's coming off um, is appropriate. Now, some will also say, well, even when you have large coal plants and natural gas plants, you know, those things aren't always running. And that really this example was the air cut market where five of their large base load natural gas plants went down. So then you get the other side saying, well, yeah, great. We have dispatchable load, but that's not always dependable either because we're seeing more of these events. One of the things that I thought was interesting from the MISO, uh, one of the execs there said, the days of these, what they call shoulder months, which are typically the spring and the fall where the loads are a little bit less, and then people have those couple months to do their maintenance and make sure things are running appropriately. She said, those things are gone. We, we no longer have these two, three shoulder months in the, in the fall and the spring because of all these different events that are continually happening. And so, you know, she basically mentioned that isn't surprising that some of our, even some of our base load stuff is you know failing because they're they're supposed to be down right now and we need to call on them to run and so i don't i don't think it's just renewables i think it's just that whole dynamic of there's significant you know there's increased load growth going on there's more load coming over from other countries all that are adding to that continual you know load of increasing and we just aren't quite prepared with being able to balance all that from not only from the miso market but even in some of those other markets and then how do you interconnect those markets, because certainly one market isn't going to be willing to give you excess generation capacity if they need it for their own market. And so you've got some of that imbalance going on as well. And I don't know there's a simple solution to that, but there certainly is frustration all around by a lot of people. And, you know, and we're certainly frustrated. We don't certainly want to shut people off, and um, but they certainly don't want us to. And, I don't know if I'm making a small note of a molehill here, but John and Dave and Dan, what do you, what have you guys heard, if anything, from, well, from we, our ratepayers? We've talked with our largest, three largest customers, and you know, we're there's so many unknowns to it. We're taking the approach of, 
here's what we're hearing, and try to make it come in, to, you know, try to plan for maybe a uh, 25, 50 to 75%, you know, ask. So maybe we're hoping that a uh, large customer can maybe just shut off some air conditioning, some, some administrative stuff to lessen their load and not have to worry about production. You know, let help them understand that if you can figure out that internally, that's going to be much better than saying we have to open up a breaker. So we're taking that approach of let's figure that out first and we'll hope this doesn't happen, but we, you know, we don't know either. We don't know if they're going to call for what, what size they're going to call for, if they call. So, but if we can have the customers looking internally going, when we study our stuff and know that if we shut down all of our AC, that gives us 20% of our load, that might be perfect. And not hopefully not mess with production. Obviously, the production part is the worst, right? Because that's that's the less where the big loss is. So, yeah. anyway, that's kind of where we're starting now. And obviously, we're having meetings with other people and other other utilities and things as this goes on. But that's where we're at at this point. Right? Historically, peak demand's been July, August. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the important piece. You know that. You know, we've, I think these guys have talked with our largest customers and I've tried to reiterate to people, it's it's not for a lack of planning on our side. Again, we've got plenty, of, we've got more than enough generation. You know, I mean, we've got almost 100 megawatts of generation and we only usually peak out at 60, 65. So when we get asked to kick on our generation, we're actually supplementing the grid to keep it reliable while the same covering our customers. So the message that I'm trying to get out there is if we have to shed load or we have to shut things down, it's not because we want to, and in fact, they're, they call on us to generate to help the regional grid system. It's a regional issue in the market. It's not a Hutchinson Utilities piece. And if we're getting called to shed load, so is Excel's territory, so is you know, Marshall Utilities. I mean, so are other utilities because it's it's a regional <coughs> northern part of the MISO market where they're going to ask to shed load. So those are a couple points I would mention if when you're out talking to people or they hear this on TV, it's it's the region. It's not. It's not just us, and, and that's a hard concept. It's so got to be very hard for those customers to understand that. Correct. If, you're, if we're sitting here saying we have plenty of generation for the community, but we still need you to do this, yeah. and that makes the ask almost even tougher. It does. You know, because it, it doesn't make sense. Because if we have enough ability to supply power, we shouldn't have to, right? Right. It just that's very confusing to the customer. And it's a frustration that we have. You know, why should we, we be ones that ask when we're we're a net exporter into the market? Right. And, it, and not to not to turn it around, but uh, you know, unfortunately, when all the power plants are running to meet electrical demand, there's no natural gas to put into storage, and that's just going to just going to drive the daily prices astronomical. I mean, today it's eight dollars and thirty three cents. It'll who knows where it'll go, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 dollars. And that's what, you know, it's going to hit generation and all of our customers eventually. Yeah, yeah potentially on both sides. And that's a piece that's still, I mean, to John's point, the transmission side of things on the natural gas side is still a constraint in a lot of areas, the southwest region, the PJM market, you know, they, they quit permitting some of those natural gas pipelines. And so if they have to dispatch generation um, to meet load, but there's a constraint on the transmission system where you just can't get the gas to places. Some of that stuff isn't going to work even with inflated prices, and so there's there's still that heightened risk there because a lot of some of the big coal plants that are going out, they're being backfilled by natural gas generation, by big basal plants, at least in some of those areas. So there's also a, an infrastructure constraint on the natural gas side of things that they can. There's only so much volume that they can flow, and so you know, it's kind of a a lot of things are playing into kind of this bad potential storm that's just kind of over the horizon here that we have to be prepared for um, as much as we can. Um, so we've got internal protocols. Dan's been working with his guys, you know, making sure we have our contacts in place, making sure we have our internal protocols that we're going to follow. We'll, we'll be working on a communication avenue to make sure that we can get stuff out there timely to the paper and to the radio and things if we have to do that and make sure we're doing it as quickly as we get notified so that if we get notified, hey, in a half hour, you guys need to, we're shedding 10 load, 10 megawatts, you know, we're going to have to get out as quickly as we can. I mean, by the time people see it or hear it, it's maybe too late. And then the other piece is the duration. You know, are you going to sh shed load for a half hour? Are you going to shed load for three hours? 
know a lot of that's going to be dependent on how much generation they have and how high that load stays for periods of time. So. Matt, the, I get updates from the city of Hutch for mosquito spraying, et cetera. Has that been a fairly su successful program to notify people that opt into that? Or? Yeah, for the ones that opt into it. <laughs> right. That's usually the challenge is getting people to take up that service. I think those that use it, it's works well. So. What, do you have an opinion on what percentage of people have opted in or use it? I can't remember what that... Half or less than half? I think it's less than half. So. Just trying to think about a way that we could quickly yeah. notify someone if we had to a impact, potential impact. I can try to even get you that, just so you can have an idea of how many people are signed up for it. I know we talked about one time the alert system where you could push out an alert, kind of like, hey, power's going out, or the, you know what I mean? But then you still, they still have to apt into it. Yeah. Encourage those people that are going to be most affected by it. Right. We really like getting some of these alerts. Yeah, if it, hits, if it trickles its way down to the residential side, I guess it'd be something to consider from an aspect, communication perspective. Technically, when did this happen before? This year? They're predicting it to happen this year, it could happen this year, sending out an alert, but couldn't have been possibly happened before this? Sure, I mean, it almost happened last year. We got real close to it happening. Yeah, so we got a hold of our customers. But they're just saying put out an alert this year to be aware of it. Yeah, I think on some of the ones where you have the, where if it looks like the weather forecast, hey, or the Midwest is going to be, the next week it's going to be 95 and humid or whatever, I think that you can be ahead of that and say, hey, community, do what you can to keep your load down, you know, voluntarily and, you know, raise your thermostat or do whatever you can, but it's going to, so I think you can be ahead a little bit of that. It's these emergency ones where either some major generation went down that we didn't know of and it wasn't. I mean, there was some weather-related stuff, but either you know the wind wasn't blowing and generations down or whatever, where it's, hey, we got more load than we anticipated, we just don't have the generating capacity because all these things have happened, where we're going to get this quick notice, or potentially a quick notice that you're kind of you know, kind of stuck going, okay, well, we'll communicate to where we think we need to shed the load, which typically... Unfortunately, it's a couple of our biggest customers is where you can make, make the immediate impact. We've also talked internally, just, you know, are there other areas? Do, you know, we've typically not done the residential. Most people try not to hit the residential side of things. And part of that is who's sitting on some of those feeders, right? So if you, you want to take down a feeder for a while, you may have a bunch of residential customers on there, but you may have other businesses along that feeder line. Um, then we, you, don't have, you don't have a designated substation for a particular customer that you know you can isolate them and so you know that's some of the internal discussions that we've had is if we had to shed three megawatts we'd shed five we'd shed ten what's the least amount of impact to the greatest amount of customers and is that is it feasible can we do that can we not we're certainly cognizant of our large customers in the manufacturing environment of our town you know, we're, we don't want to see waste of product and things like that either. You know, so we talked about, you know, can you shed low where it's just air conditioning? And, you know, if it's an hour, you know, can people, can residents go without air conditioning for a year? I mean, is their food going to be okay for a year versus having large customers with large products having to scrap things? But some of that's going to be dependent on... It's voluntary. Right. How much they want cut, for how long, and... So like Dave said, hopefully some... Some of our larger customers, hey, we can shed X amount of load without really needing real major impact, at least the production line of things, and then we can kind of see, you know, what's the risk of us getting above that load shed, um, and just working with our customers so they've been receptive to looking at that. Well, if you can get buy-in and, and voluntary movement by the customer base, I think, of course, that's preferable. You know, it's not nearly as shocking right. than getting shot off. Here was it. And of course, you avoid hospital and things like that, right? Correct. Hospital, the other piece we have to avoid is anyone that's on life support or um, pieces of equipment that, you know, right. so we have to make sure we're staying away from customers like that. So, you know, there'll be certain feeders. If we, if we decide, hey, we can do some different things, there'll be certain areas that we just couldn't touch anyway uh, because of life and death situations. Everyone should understand. 
I think it sounds like you guys are on top of it and have a good plan and whatever you need from the commission, just let us know, I think. Yeah. And keep us informed. Yeah. Yeah, we certainly will. One last, one last passing thought on, the, on related, unrelated, but uh, does, does what's going on in the macro energy market support us considering uh, accelerating demolition of units, three, four, and eight, and setting up the facilities for potential new generation projects. That's all right. I'm asking. That's the opportunity. That's the conversation for a different day, but I'd be interested in hearing your guys' thoughts at a future commission meeting on that. Yeah, I think we'll talk, touch on that too at the workshop next week. That was one of the things that's kind of in the pipeline too. Every scenario has opportunity somehow. Yeah. I look forward to hearing about that. All right, thank you. So at item six, policies, we have a couple to review. Looks like we have two to approve changes to. Andy? Uh, so the pregnancy and parenting leave policy, we're adding the word leave behind FMLA. FMLA by itself is the act. Um, so we're just clarifying that it's a family and medical leave act leave. Um, and then also in that section, under the reasonable unpaid work time for nursing mothers. Um, under a new law that took effect this year, the breaks are now paid breaks versus unpaid breaks. We're gonna have that clarification if approved. And with the title of reasonable unpaid work time for nursing mothers, I neglected to mark that as paid. So if you do approve it, I'll change that as well. Um, and then for the family and medical leave policy itself, just adding clarification there, adding the word leave where appropriate. Sounds pretty simple. I make a motion to approve the proposed changes. Additionally, the other change that Angie highlighted. Thanks. Motion by Anthony. I'll second. Second by Don. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion is approved. Unfinished business, we have none. Item eight, A is to approve disposal of surplus, surplus property at plant number one. Yeah, so Mike wanted to have, he's got, they got some old pieces of equipment down there that just haven't been used in a long time. So I wanted him to come in front of the board and you know, start disposing and start cleaning out some of those old areas to make room uh, for things. And so um, what's in the packet, he was gonna be here, but he couldn't make it. So he's just getting approval to get rid of some of these miscellaneous pieces of equipment um, that aren't being used anymore. They'll put them out there on gov deals. They're not quite sure what they'll get for some of the stuff since the stuff is pretty old. And, but if they can get a couple hundred bucks for you know, some of this equipment. So is there a threshold that we need to approve or is it just any sale at all? Sale, sale of anything that we're gonna dispose of that we think there's some value to. Um, this one was kind of, well, there may be some value, maybe someone will pay you a hundred bucks for something, but it's always better to make sure that you guys are approving anything that we're selling uh, of public equipment, so. We're asking you to do that stuff. Some of the inventory that we've gotten rid of in the past, just inventory items that there's just no value to it. Um, some, some of that stuff hasn't come forward, but it's an obsolete inventory item that doesn't fit any units anymore, or whatever we've scrapped. But some of these things we think there's a little bit of value that some of you may be willing to pay for. So I'll make a motion to approve sale of these items. Motion by Don. I'll second. Second by Bob. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion is approved. Item 8B is to declare a special meeting for HUC's cost of service study workshop being held on Tuesday, May 31st, 2022 at 11 a.m. at the Hutchinson Event Center. Move to declare a special meeting. I'll second. Motion by Anthony, second by Don. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion is approved. Item 8C is to approve rescheduling of the June 29th, 2022 regular commission meeting to June 22nd. I think we've discussed this already too, right? Yeah, we did last month. Last month, yeah. Yeah. I'll make a motion to approve the rescheduling of the June meeting to the 22nd. I'll second. Motion by Don, second by Bob. All in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? That motion is also approved. Agenda item number nine is to adjourn. Unless there's anything else. I'll make a vote to adjourn. Second. Motion by Bob.